everyone. Welcome back to our Make Way for Youth podcast. Uh, my name is Warindi. I'm the co-host of this podcast. And I have my colleague, Bertha, Bertha joining in today. Bertha, please say hi to the audience. Hi, everybody. Happy to have you here. And we hope that you will learn so much with our content today. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Wilda Tieno. I'm one of the youth panel members in the regional and global youth panel and also serving in the capacity of a youth panel member in the Kenyan context. Thank you so much and uh, I really appreciate for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. And we have our guest who's called Jethro. Jethro, welcome. You're a very fast guest, so we're very excited to have a guest um, in this podcast. So Jethro, the floor is, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you so much for having me on the podcast today, and I uh, hope to have a fruitful uh, discussion. All right, thank you so much for the intros. So our um, topic today is intersectionality in sexual reproductive health and rights, and we want to just dive in into what intersectionality means, how it can be, you know, how, how can we apply that interse intersectionality lens into our SHR work, and maybe to get hopefully some real life um, examples from Jethro who um, programs for SRHR at Chesh Cheshire. Jethro, maybe you can share with our audience uh, what exactly you do at Cheshire. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much once more. My name is uh, Stephen Jethro Piri, and I currently work at the Zambia Federation of Disability Organizations, ZAPFOD, as a programs officer. So Zapford is a, a collaborating partner under uh, Cheshire Homes Society of Zambia in the MECO project. So that's basically who we are. And uh, maybe just to give a brief highlight of who and what Zapford is. So Zapford yes. basically is an umbrella civil society organization of and for persons with uh, disabilities. You will understand that there are a lot of organizations of persons with disabilities, but then Zapford comes and sits in as an umbrella civil society organization with a mandate to coordinate the disability movement in Zambia from a civil society uh, perspective. And Zafford's work uh, really revolves around three things, and that is um, ad, uh, capacity building for organizations of persons with disabilities, um, research to inform our advocacy, and also we, we do our advocacy itself as Zafford. So basically, in a nutshell, that is who Zafford is. Um, so a question to the panel um, is, what does intersectionality mean to you? Before we do the dictionary definition of intersectionality, I just want to find out when you think about intersectionality, particularly in SRHR or in any um, social justice causes, what picture do you have in your mind about what intersectionality and intersectionality lens is? We can start with Bath. Well, when I when I hear intersectionality, I remember the intersection sets in school, <laughs> where we were told set A, set B, and set C, and then they intersect somewhere at the middle. So, in defining it, I would say it's a concept that really looks at or represents different facets of a situation or an individual or the like. Mm. that's yeah. very visual like you took my mind back to 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 those days in, in school <laughs> um just what about you yeah um i i like the way Ma, uh betha comes out and she uses the the word concept i i personally like using the word concept also each time i look at the the, the phrase or word uh intersectionality so when i hear the word intersectionality i look at it as a concept that is used to understand how the different, for example, different vulnerabilities can exist in one individual or the different opportunities can actually exist in one individual. So for me, intersectionality really uh, looks both at uh, the, the vulnerabilities existing in one place and also it may be the opportunities that are existing or the advantages that are existing in an individual and how these opportunities or disadvantages or vulnerabilities either in hinder or influence what this individual wants to attain. 
both in mm-hmm. life and in the community. So just to, um, what are some of this um, to conceptualize or to have a clearer picture of what these vulnerabilities or opportunities are, um, what are they exactly? What are the different types of vulnerabilities that can exist in one person? Okay. So um, when I speak of the different vulnerabilities existing, for example, in one individual, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at an individual that, for example, is a, a girl child, is a girl, she's young, and then she's an orphan, and then she has, she's living with HIV, then she lives in a slum area, then she has a disability. So you look at all these different vulnerabilities. Her being a girl child, she's young, uh, she has HIV, she is an orphan, and then she lives in a slum area, and she is a person with a disability. So I'm trying to look at how these different vulnerabilities are existing in this one individual, and how each of them, so intersectionality now is a concept that will help us understand how each one of these vulnerabilities hinder or work together to hinder this individual from accessing what she wants to access. It might be, for example, in the context of sexual productive health. Uh, How do all these hinder this individual from accessing sexual productive health uh, services? How does this child, being a girl child, hinder her from accessing, uh, for example, uh, uh, contraceptives at a facility? How does this person being uh, a person with a disability hinder them from accessing this service? How does them being an orphan influence their negative, uh, I mean, how, how does it influence the negative aspect of them accessing or how does that hinder them from accessing? For example, being an orphan, you don't have anyone to speak to you about uh contraceptives for example and so already you are deprived of information so how does this person being a person with h or living with hiv how will that hinder them or uh, you know uh, uh, form a hindrance or a barrier for them to access uh, sra hr uh, services then when we speak to things like opportunities i'm looking at an individual who for example is a boy child is 25 years old she's you know maybe he's he's working um, he's a son to a member of parliament. Uh, you know, all the parents are alive. So those are opportunities that will exist in this individual or that exist in this individual. And now I'm um, intersectionality then will help us understand how do these uh, different opportunities support this individual or influence this individual to actually access a service without really uh, challenges. The fact that she's he's he's a he's a you know a, a, a man, uh, the fact that he's he's 25 years old, he's educated, he's exposed to knowledge. The parents are there; mm-hmm. they've spoken to her. I mean, to him, uh, he is a son of a member of parliament. Who, when when he walks into, for example, a facility, every health personnel will freeze and give room to them. So there are all how all these different opportunities exist. So basically, that is how intersectionality comes into play. So we are looking at some people have certain privileges that others do not have, such as, you know, gender, sex, class, and then this intersects and makes one person have better opportunities when they have the privileges, and the one who doesn't, doesn't get to access certain services that they need. So Vilda, I'm going to, yes, so Vilda, I'm going to bring you in. Um, and just ask from your from your from your advocacy work, particularly in disability justice, how do you see intersectionality um, um, coming in, or I mean, the presence of an intersectionality lens or the absence of? How does that? How what has been your experience or your observation in this um, area in particular? Uh, thank you so much, Warindi. And uh, one thing that I want to say is that uh, when you talk about, for example, disability, 
it's just one lens just as a uh, butter and jetra explained that it's just one lens of one of the vulnerability that one might be having and uh, i want to pick this from a perspective of having a story from one of the safe spaces that we are having so imagine uh, a, a person with uh, a young girl who identifies as a person with disability at the same time she is a teen mom of course uh, she's 18 years and then at the same time coming from the informal settlement so you see uh as we are talking about someone might be a woman at the same time of course uh, being a woman sometimes comes with its own vulnerability coming from the informal settlements or coming also from maybe rural areas or urban areas also come with its own vulnerabilities but you see that uh these are uh, a number of uh can we also say intersecting vulnerabilities that interact yeah. with the same person? So in, when you talk about uh, access to information, and I'm looking at this uh, young person where she's already a teen mom and uh, having a disability, of course, is now a bit challenging. Also navigating the health system, now that people will get to judge you because first of all, mm -hmm you are a person with disability and the way you are brought up is that uh, when you are a person with disability for some time you kind of doesn't deserve to maybe um, get to have like good friends because uh, for you just being there as Vilda or as any other young person it's more of there's something that maybe your family members did that is uh, making you to be in such a way so I just want to support what has been said by my uh, the other panelists about just uh, from a perspective uh, of uh, intersectionality, we find it in a way that we don't uh, we don't look in a way that somebody lives a single issue life. And apart from even just talking about disability, that is why we are talking about the aspect of intersectionality. So when we just look at the disability perspective, even if we are addressing the challenges that a young person might be facing you realize there are so many things that we might be failing to address for example when you talk about yes uh she identifies as a woman with disability how about social economic empowerment does it really exist now that uh these different identities intersect and uh, uh, might hinder her from accessing uh, some services at one point yeah so from the disability perspective I think the aspect of applying an intersectional lens when looking at uh, someone or an identity that someone has is very important so that apart from just uh, being or having this one identity, we talk about disability, then you realize that it's not only that, but there are a number of things. Uh, for example, I want to talk about uh someone like a caregiver to a person with disability and i'm looking at from a perspective of maybe this person is also you have a youth who is a caregiver to a person with disability and you see from our perspective if you are just to look at uh one lens then you realize that uh as much as we might be addressing just talking to uh maybe we want to address uh, the challenge that comes with uh being a person with disability then you realize that for example if this person is someone who has a severe disability that really the, he or she depends on someone to take care of them then it means that if you're not even going to talk about the caregiver of such a person then we are not employing an intersectional lens remember for example if i'm a caregiver then it means that i'm dedicating almost all of my time to yes. be doing work to help you and uh thank you so much for bringing this up warindi thank you yeah, yeah um i realized um at some point that as you know um as women or as as people we are seen in one in one particular lens or we are seen as if to have one particular identity mm -hmm. um let's say like uh, women who live in informal settlements they are seen only in one lens, which is there are women you know, yeah. who are socioeconomically disadvantaged. And then mm -hmm. other things, other identities that exist in themselves are not visible or, or are not seen or are not, um, what's it called, are not taken into account when programming for such services, such as sexual and productive health and rights. But now that we have 
an understanding of what intersection intersectionality is uh, thanks to our very amazing and very educated and very learned panelists i wanted to bring you in bartha and just get into what are some best practices um that you have seen or that you have implemented in your advocacy work for srhr especially in the application of an intersectionality lens in programming yeah, you know how we keep on saying we are not going to leave anyone behind? I think the benefit of intersectionality is that it leaves the reality of the notion not leaving anyone behind. Because with intersectionality, you are designing interventions for somebody whilst having full acknowledgement of the compounded vulnerabilities that they that they face, for example, and the benefit is that whatever it is that has been set to target any person can reach any person without having anyone left behind. So in SRHR activism and you know the work that we do, I've realized that it's very beneficial when we plan programs with an intersection with e with an intersectionality lens because it enables us to put on board people that are usually left behind in these programmings. Mm, um, thank you, Bartha. Any insights, Jethro, from the field or from your work? Thank you so much once more. So um, I'll, I'll give some, some practical examples. I, I think uh, early this month, uh, I, I was with Julia. I remember Beth, we were communicating about Julia uh, from mm -hmm. Amos, who came through uh, to Kanyama Level 1, where we have our inclusive safe space for young people. So remember the conversations that, no, she was told, uh, this place is, you know, you need to be careful. Like everyone was scared until even the, the taxi driver that you wanted to, to get to, you know, in terms of her coming to the, the, the same venue or the hospital, uh, I think refused because the notion that they have, this is an area that is, it's a, it's, it's a compound. It's, it's perceived to be dangerous. And each time there are issues, for example, to talk, to do with cholera, that is the center. That is where cholera is attributed to. When it comes to flooding, for example, that is the area. When it comes to people that are living in abject poverty, you can still refer to the same area. So this is an area that is completely I would say off the grid when we discuss about people that are having a proper uh, lifestyle. Then mm -hmm. among us, this, or in, it is from this community, again, where we have people with disabilities. And um, mm -hmm. now look at it from this angle. These are people with disabilities who are probably using wheelchairs, who are using tricycles. Now imagine it's, it's in rain season and the area is flooded. How then do they access that service? As how then do they move or propel themselves from their localities to the healthy facility? Then mm -hmm. at the same time, the, the roads are uneven. It is very hard for one to act. When you look at the, the, the tires or wheels for these wheelchairs and tricycles, believe you me, you really understand what we mean when we say the roads are uneven in these, in these communities. And so a lot of them, again, these are young people. So number one, they are young people. And because they are young people with disabilities, you realize that they are coming from broken families. And since they are coming from broken families, their mothers are the ones that are also, you know, selling in the streets as street vendors. Therefore, their right to education has been deprived. They are not going to school. So even the level of their understanding, if, for example, from having an interaction with Betha and, you know, Warindi and, and Vida, then I go back to a facility and start using English, then I may lose my, my participants. I may lose uh, the young people that I'm targeting to speak to. So intersectionality now is very important in this context because now it helps me understand, even as I get to communicate with these young people, that I'm dealing with young people that have not been to school, for example, who may need very localized language for them to understand the concept. Secondly, uh, the fact that we are a Christian nation and people are in abject poverty. Believe you me, many people who actually follow, uh, 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 I would say, men of God, in Zambia we call them papas here. They are, they are, they are called <laughs> papas all, all over. So 
there's an aspect of religion again that comes into play that their parents might might have inculcated in them and there are some values that they might have inculcated in them so it has to take the aspect or the concept of intersectionality for me to be able to understand that for this individual to be able to accept it to understand and accept this uh you know conversation around access to sexual productive health i may have to take a, a certain route i'm looking at these young people who probably i may just tell you should be coming to access a service without intersectionality i may not understand the challenges and struggles that this person may have when it comes to for example rain season and we may go on tv and say uh for example our our, our minister of, of health she's on record when she mentions that there's a high you know infectious rate uh, a new uh, infectious rate infection rate uh, you know amongst adolescents now it is important for us to understand and she mentions that some of the reasons are you know non compliance to these you know uh, medications for example art now we need to understand that what is really stopping this young individual from coming to access the service maybe it's because we had floods maybe it's because the terrain is bad maybe it's because they do not have you know, mobility aids to help them get to a facility. So with the concept of intersectionality in handling young people with disabilities and helping them access the service, I think intersectionality really plays a very, very important role because then it helps us to see beyond just them not coming to access the service. But want to understand, or it helps us to understand why are they not coming to access this service? Sure. And, and um, also sometimes, you, yeah, sometimes you realize that this young uh, individual, for example, those with hearing impairment, may want mm -hmm. to come to a facility. But when they get to a facility, they have no one to help them communicate or they've got no one to communicate with them effectively. So you realize that they end up, uh, you know, stopping coming to attend. I, I have a very good and practical example of uh, uh, young people in Matero where we also have another safe space. So initially when we were, when, when you know, we started this conversation, we had young people who were deaf. But I realized that after a certain, certain follow-ups, I realized that they, these young people who are deaf had actually stopped going to the facility. And I asked a question uh, when, I, when we were meeting. And they told me it's because there's, there's really no one to interpret for them. So there are always passengers when they get to these safe spaces. And that is why with the concept of intersectionality, once we get to understand this and we begin to you know, implement it even from the uh, government perspectives, believe you me, we will be able to ensure that even communication in these facilities is all accessible. There are a lot of uh, maybe brochures, flyers that are done on, for example, cervical cancer that can be displayed anywhere. But how about those that are blind? How is this information reaching out? There are people here in, in our communities who under the facility may go out in our communities spreading the gospel, preaching using a megaphone. But how about those that are deaf? How is this information you know, getting to them. So that's basically how intersectionality, you know, can help us understand, uh, you know, the, the different needs of people with disabilities in our communities. Well, I think that's a very powerful um, stance. All I could hear from yeah. from what you're saying was um, leave no one behind, which is the main um, aim of this particular podcast. I actually think that's what I'm going to name this podcast episode, um, leave no one behind, because it actually captures you know like you can't just have services that are inaccessible to people in your community you need to make sure that you have factored in everyone otherwise you don't you don't get your population to get into these particular spaces um so thank yeah. you just for those uh fantastic insights especially especially with your experience on the ground and, and, the, and the lovely work that you're doing so Bertha and Wilda, i don't know if you have any more questions or any more insights to share um, really, Warindi, it's an interest on my end from Jethro to know how they've been able to implement intersectionality in their work with with uh, persons with disability, especially that he's just narrated a few other examples, very insightful examples. Um, but if you if you could also share how it is implemented, like, are you very intentional about it? Is it from the planning stage, or at what point do you start to consider intersectionality? Yes, um, I think I should I should mention that um, in, in the disability movement, one thing that we should be able to understand is if we speak to inclusion, there are two concepts that we need to understand. And the first concept is the principle of universal design, 
and the principle of reasonable accommodation. So when we speak to the principle of universal design, we simply mean from inception, the moment you begin to develop a program, a product, you know, if, even if it's infrastructure, from inception, the moment you begin to come up with a plan, already begin to think about people with disabilities. It's like arranging for a workshop and you only realize that you need a sign language interpreter when you get to the venue. So the right yeah. ideal situation is that the moment you are budgeting, writing a budget to a donor, for example, already you know that there's an aspect of sign language interpreters that is needed. So already you begin to have that conversation. And that is the same approach that I personally use uh, because I'm the one that is actually implementing this. I'm the officer that is implementing the, 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 the MECWA project. So from inception, already I begin to think about how am I going to reach out to these young people because I'm coming from a community uh, you know, of, of this a similar nature. So already I begin to think about young people with disabilities and how am I going to speak to them? What is it that you have sometimes to, to fine tune it? You may not necessarily follow the formal way because these are young people who are informal. So you have to go an informal way and bring them to help them understand what you're trying to speak to in a formal manner. Thank you. Uh, yes, Warindi, I just wanted to add something, and I, I love how Jethro really spoke about it and bringing the aspect of uh, the universal design and uh, the reasonable accommodation that must be there. Especially now, I'm looking from now having also worked with uh, a number of young people from different areas, especially, for example, in Kenya, where uh, now people we are talking about being intentional when you really want to engage persons with disability and like mm -hmm. uh a long time ago when for example uh for example somebody might tell me to mobilize i want to engage young persons with disability but then they are giving me a specification please bring a person who is uh physically impaired who doesn't need a guide and you see when you are doing this then automatically you are limiting people at the same time it's a kind of discrimination but with the intersectionality approach where you even go deep down to the rural areas to just uh have to talk with the young persons who identify as a person with disability and just uh, to ensure that there is this reasonable accommodation at all costs. For example, if you are engaging and then there's uh, somebody who needs a guide, then you, if you are budgeting, then you need also to budget for the guide who is going to be with this young person who maybe you are interested in engaging in your activities. And uh, I just wanted to echo that I really love the perspective that intersectionality is bringing. And as you said, Warindi, just uh, we are going forward to leaving no one behind in this uh, conversation. Thank you. Uh, Warindi? Yes. Um, maybe just to build up on this conversation that uh, we are having, yes, we talk about intersectionality and uh, many a times, of course, when uh, we are doing something, there might be challenges that also we face when we are promoting, for example, we are talking about intersectionality, but then there are several maybe uh, uh, challenges that might come when you are talking about implementing these uh, the concept of intersectionality. So I just wanted to ask Jethro maybe to tell us, are there any challenges you have faced uh, in implementing intersectionality? And uh, are there maybe solutions that you are using to address such uh, challenges? OK, um, thank you so much. So um, that's a very uh, interesting question. And um, intersectionality being a concept like we've uh, spoken to it, you know, in our uh, early stages of uh, this conversation. And also trying to understand the, the communities where we are working from, the young people that we are bringing on board. So it being a concept, I think there's the, the, the major challenges that we may speak to um really trying to get these young people to understand because we are not only training them to be able to access the service, but then training them to be agents of change themselves. I remember I, I had, um, I, I was, you know, convening a safe space meeting and after the meeting, 
one young man in in Matelo in Matelo constituency he has a, a physical disability he actually mentioned to me that we do not only want to be beneficiaries of these conversations but we also want to be engaged and go out so that we are able to begin to participate not only as the recipients of the information but we also want to give out mm -hmm. this information so really when it comes to intersectionality the challenges are really trying to to bring it home to the to the most basic level in order for young people to be able to grasp it and be able to work out with it as you know uh, a concept especially that these are young people that are coming from different setups these are young people that have got different beliefs these are young people that for example if if uh, they are recently diagnosed with uh, uh, hiv for example acceptance is is a challenge and also amongst young people themselves really getting other young people to ride with the conversation of intersectionality that is a challenge but really it needs you like i mentioned that it, it may need us to take and to go in formal way so that we can become more formal or you, we can communicate mm -hmm. the formal uh, conversation if you attack it mm -hmm. in in a formal way there's a high chance that you 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 lose out a lot of young people because then it, it will be a strange thing it will be a difficult situation for them but the moment you try to bring it home and bring in a lot of examples like our citing where um, you say i, I remember uh, when when uh, julia came so we had we had a, a, a number of young people who when i was trying to explain the concept of intersectionality i drew and i mean i i wrote characteristics of of three different individuals and when i asked a question of saying amongst this person or amongst the three who can easily access a service at kanyama level one hospital majority of them responded and said this person who lives here in kanyama not the mp because the mp stays very far but this one who lives here in kanyama can access it fast so for them accessing it fast was in terms of speed and not in terms of uh it being accessible for the individual so really it, it needs us to be more informal than get to be formal i think that is the approach that i've been using to navigate the challenges that are there for me to be able to reach out and be able to address remember the the religious aspect the and for example the the, the issues to do with um uh, intersex for example lgbt uh lgbtqi those are conversations that are still a very difficult conversation for young people especially in our setups these are very difficult conversations currently until now so it, it really needs you to go a bit you know informal then speak about the formal conversations um so thank you everyone for coming to this podcast and having such an insightful conversation on intersectionality, um, especially in implementing or programming for sexual reproductive health and rights. Jethro, you've been an amazing guest. Um, I've, I've actually personally learned a lot from you. I feel like we have scratched the surface on what intersectionality mm -hmm. really is, and, and especially your grassroots um, experience and your challenges and your solutions that you've shared are really insightful. So to our audience, I do hope that you've had um, an educative and informative and a lovely uh, podcast to listen to today. Um, if you haven't already, please listen to our first um, episode. It's a Get to Know Us episode to get to know the co-hosts and also catch us on, on our next episode, which is actually going to be part two of this particular episode for us to really, really further get into intersectionality particularly in, in, you know, grassroots experience or programming experience. Uh, so, asante ni sana. See you next time. Bye.